go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Courtney Thaxton. I am a co-chair of the Gene Curation Working Group, and I will be presenting for you today the updates for the new SOP version 9 that were just released at the beginning of June. Um, I am here by myself. Jenny is not able to attend, so she sends her apologies. If by any chance you have questions in the middle of this, um, if you would please put them in the chat, that is the best way for me to be able to see them. Um, you can also raise a hand or um, open up to ask a question during the presentation, but we will have time at the end of the call. Um, for all of you, you've nicely um, stayed on mute, but if you can, please make sure you're on mute if you're not asking a question to reduce background noise, that would be very much appreciated. Um, it is likely that we may be able to even leave the call early today and you get your time back. Um, but thank you again for this time and we will be going through these new gene curation SOP version nine updates. So I just wanna give you a brief overview of what these updates are. You can also go to the ClinGen website under the gene curation training materials and find a highlighted list and SOP. Uh, we are going to go through updates we have for the gene curation workflow. We're also going to go up to classification definitions. This was the major change for this SOP version 9. Um, we're also going to talk about evidence collection and the use of databases for this collection of evidence. We're also going to talk about segregation for autosomal recessive disorders and just some examples and points to consider, especially if um, your segregation in a family is not um, behaving as our calculation is um, calculator is programmed to assess. Uh, proband identifiers and the evidence summary um, just again points to consider when you're putting in these IDs and descriptions of individuals. We'll also talk about a few updates to the uh, website as well as a new appendix D. And I forgot to put it here, but we're also going to talk about the new releases from the GCI and different data um, and functionality at the very end. So for that gene curation workflow, you'll notice that there is a new figure. Again, it's very similar to the last, but what we really want to impress upon you is that it is extremely important that we follow this new work uh, workflow in which pre-curation is required for all gene disease relationships. Um, some of these can be as fast as saying it's a single gene disease entity, you're collecting it, but it needs to be done. Um, so this is indicating, please start in the ClinGen gene tracker. You can either talk, um, have access yourself as a bio curator or talk with your GSEP coordinator. They may be entering this information, but please make sure this information is entered prior to going into the gene curation interface. This is going to be the lumping and splitting criteria, but it's also going to be entering in the Mondo ID you intend to use for your gene disease mode of inheritance record in the GCI. This allows for the integration of information between these two systems. So again, please enter this uh, pre-curation in the gene tracker first before you go into your GCI. Please check with your GCEP coordinator or the person responsible for entering this data. The GCI is the system of record for the gene curation and it facilitates the publishing of the record to clinicalgenome.org. But I do wanna make it clear and we'll go on the other side that these pre-curations are now published. I also want to give you a little bit of information for future um, releases and future functionality that the gene tracker and the GCI are moving to of this federated workflow. And what that means is they are going to operate like a single system. Um, that is our ultimate hope and there will be really good transitions into each of them. So um, please make sure to look at this workflow and kind of work by this proposed workflow. And why are pre-curations so important? Not only are they establishing that gene disease um, relationship and the curated disease entity, but that pre-curation data is now published online at ClinGen. You all are doing an exceptional amount of work. Um, this is really important for us to connect those omen and phenotypes that have also been included as part of the curation and for efforts for us to be able to have harmonization between omen and Mondo with ClinGen. So please make sure that they are included in there. Um, they will be published to the website. But also I want to note, you have an area in a note section, check for spelling in those free text note sections. There isn't a spell check there um, before you publish. These records are only published at the time your full 
record is published from the GCI. So it's a coordinated publishing. Um, so again, check for all of these before you move through and do your final publishing of your gene disease mode of inheritance record from the GCI. So now we'll move on to the gene disease validity classification update. So this was a substantial change um, that we took place from SOP version eight to nine. Um, we do have updates to each of the classifications um, and they are now provided. Uh, you will notice that we used to have on previous versions, a table that went through that evidence. This has now been removed as a table and each of them are spelled out. What is really nice is that we also provide some example curations for you to look at over all of the different mode of inheritance that we have. Um, so again, you'll see uh, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant and X-linked as best as we can for each of these classifications. You'll also begin to notice that the definitions in some cases are broadened to allow for different scenarios across GCEPs and clinical domains. For instance, you can notice with limited and moderate, they used to have some metrics on fewer than three observations or at least three or above. Those have now been removed and we'll go through that in detail. The reason for this is that the Gene Curation Working Group actually conducted a little bit of a data analysis experiment um, to see how classifications were being used across GSEPs and specifically looking at limited disputed, refuted, and no known disease relationship. Um, so this was across 316 curations at the time this was performed last summer. And so this work really helped to provide some useful examples and these points to consider when using these four classifications in particular. So if we move on to refuted, this is going to be very similar. That evidence refuting the initial reported evidence or role of the gene in the specified disease has been reported and significantly outweighs any evidence supporting the role of the gene disease relationship. So this is very similar to what it was previously. This designation is to be applied at the discretion of the clinical domain experts after thorough review of the available data. So some examples of when you may want to use refuted include all existing genetic evidence has been ruled out, leaving the gene with essentially no valid evidence remaining after an original claim. You may also want to choose refuted if initially reported probands were later found to have an alternative cause of disease. Another reason may be that initially reported probands were later determined not to have the disease in question. It may in fact be it was a different disease and you want to refute to get that original gene disease assertion out of the literature um, and so that it will no longer affect gene testing panels and return of results um, to individuals with variations in that gene with the disease it is not associated with. Um, and you might also want to consider this when statistically rigorous case control data demonstrate no enrichment in cases versus controls. Um, so these are just a few of the highlighted examples that we found when we were reviewing those refuted curations um, across the different expert panels, but it is not limited to these. So again, hopefully this will be helpful to you all as you begin to think about um, the possibility of when you may want to use refuted. Moving on to disputed, um, this is going to be a situation where you have an assertion of a gene disease relationship. The initial evidence is not compelling from a perspective of currently, or there's conflicting evidence that has arisen. Now the conflicting evidence and positive don't necessarily have to outweigh each other. That's just that there's an amount of both. Some examples where you may want to consider disputed, but wouldn't necessarily go on to refuted potentially are, only a few cases with nonspecific, genetically heterogeneous phenotypes and missense variants with no convincing experimental data available. So what this means is that even though it's disputed, some of these could still get 0 0.1 points, but if you only have three people and 0.3, do you really feel that this is convincing when there's no understanding of the mechanism, no experimental or functional assays to support that gene disease relationship? Another example may be all reported cases have been scored at zero, right? The sum of the genetic evidence is below one after GSEP review. This may be because those variants are too high of a frequency in NOMAD, right? In the general population to be considered pathogenic. That might be a reason to start with disputed. That might be a reason to go to refuted. Just consider that when you talk to with your GSEP. 
And another reason may be the initially reported variants have now been identified as having a population too, free, uh, too high, which is what we discussed too, which may be why you score them zero. Um, other reasons to score zero, many of you may be talking about specifically phenotypes and whether individuals fit in that phenotype. Obviously, that might be a reason, or if they have alternative um, variations in genes knows, known to cause the same disease. So again, just think about these as you are performing those curations, and do you see these consistently coming up across the programs you're curating? Highlight that and bring that to your GSEP for discussion. No known disease relationship. So um, this is indicating there is evidence for a causal role in monogenic disease of interest, right? Um, and, but there has been no reports within the literature. And this is going to be published, pre-published, um, or present in public databases. So really, this means that there has never been a human that has been reported to have variation in that gene of interest and disease. How can you even get these genes, you may ask? Well, Many of you are picking genes um, and many of the GSEPs are picking genes because they are based off of candidate genes from linkage oh intervals, God. animal models. It could also be because um, they're on a gene testing. Hey, how's it going? Oh, ready, can everybody? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, this could be because it was also on a gene testing panel because it may have had some functional evidence. But if you are not finding any cases of a human that has been asserted to have variation in that gene of interest with the disease, this is when you can use no known disease relationship. If the claim of a relationship has been reported, but the evidence is minimal or not compelling, it's 0 0.1 or you scored at zero, please consider limited, disputed, or refuted. If you're going more towards the 0 0.1 or 1 points, you may think that there is compelling evidence for limited. If you're going more to 0 0.1 or 0, consider those disputed or refuted. The one caveat for this is that if you do score an animal model, there will be a tag designating animal model only under no known disease relationship to be published to clinicalgenome.org. Now, we want you to know that that's only if that animal model has been scored. So if you entered an animal model in your PMID in the GCI, but you scored it or did not score it, it will not show up with this tag. So if you really wanted to say animal model only, then it needs to be a scored animal model. Now I'll pause for a second if you all have any questions on refuted, disputed, or no known disease relationship. Great. So we'll move on to the remaining ones. Um, coming on to limited, again, limited should be applied when experts consider the gene disease relationship to be plausible, um, but the evidence is not sufficient to score as moderate, just meaning there's a limited amount of evidence. You'll notice we took off less than three cases because there are instances where um, there were curations that were limited that may have six cases or 10 cases, but only one case that had a variant that seemed plausible. Um, and because there was a lack of any um, information, uh, functional assays for molecular mechanism, maybe it was just not enough to move to moderate. Um, these are some of those different things you want to think about, right? Um, is the number, the variance, and whether they have support for pathogenicity, those functional evidence. You may also want to consider limited if there's just a few number of cases, but they do have consistent phenotypic presentation. Obviously, if you have something that's very, very heterogeneous, so there's multiple genes that can cause a, a seemingly in, um, the seemingly or identical phenotype, um, you may want to you know, think about that before you go to limited in a disputed or refuted or how many number of cases or evidence that you need to support for limited. You also may have a single case with a rare or distinct phenotype in a de novo occurrence in a highly constrained gene that might be enough to use for a limited. And also, again, rare and distinct phenotype and biallelic loss of function variants, so suggestive of a molecular mechanism of loss of function, excuse me. We do want to indicate, though, that the limited category should not be applied in circumstances where none of the presented evidence is compelling. Again, maybe every evidence you have was scored zero. In these circumstances, the disputed category should be considered. 
So moderate, again, moderate evidence that could be, you know, uh, three cases, it could be 10 cases, right? We wanted to take off an act actual metric and really have you all be able to discuss the amount of evidence and how compelling it is for you to think that it should go to a moderate level of classification. We, we do want to suggest that it demonstrates some con convincing genetic evidence. So again, probands harboring variants with sufficient supporting evidence for disease causality with or without experimental evidence. Um, if you do feel very confident on the genetic side of things and you've gotten to the scoring range for moderate of the seven to 11, then you can apply that moderate classification. Um, and also that the role of this gene and disease may not have been independently reported, right? Because it could have been everyone is on one case, but no convincing evidence has emerged that contradicts the role of the gene. And just to remind you, right, anything that meets the moderate classification, um, it is one of those classifications that's reported by the ACMG to be able to be included and or potentially returned of results of variants within that gene um, for that disease. So uh, definitely have careful consideration when using that moderate classification. Strong, again, this is very similar to what it was before that we do want to have um, independently demonstrated the role of the gene in the disease in at least two separate studies by different independent labs um, that will provide that strong supporting evidence for this role. Um, this just shows reproducibility. Um, you may also want to look, depending on your particular area, that it's shown up in different populations or groups, right, just to make sure there's not consistent, although founders do mean that there is a gene disease relationship, right? Even if you are from the same population or group or have the same variant, these are different things that you can consider and all of them you want to make sure that you note um, those intricacies or nuances in your evidence summary. Also demonstrating considerable genetic evidence. So we want to say numerous unrelated probands harboring variants with sufficient supporting evidence for disease causality. Um, so definitely make sure that you're putting enough um, people there um, and probands that have variations in the gene with the disease that you're um, specifically looking at so that when it's published on the ClinGen website, it's very apparent to um, anyone reading this uh, final curation summary, right? That there was demonstrated causality. Also that there's compelling gene level evidence of different types of supporting experimental data is present usually, but we do want to highlight this as new. It is not required to reach this designation. I think before people interpreted that they had to have experimental evidence to go from moderate to strong, and that is not needed. In some cases, we just know there's not experimental evidence or animal models for specific gene disease relationships. So it is not required. You can still move up if you have um, all of the other um, caveats here or recommendations like those two separate studies and that you are 12 points and above, but maybe have not reached repetition over time, meaning that three-year time point. Also, you wanna make sure there's no convincing evidence that contradicts the role of the gene and disease. So for definitive, the main difference between strong and definitive has not changed. It's the replication over time and the need for two independent score publications over the last three years time. Um, that is the major difference between strong and definitive. Um, again, replication over time. When you're in the GCI, you wanna make sure that you click that little box so that it automatically goes from strong to definitive as the points range is the same, which is 12 to 18. You also want to consider that variants dis, um, that disrupt function or have strong genetic and population data are considered convincing of disease causality in this framework. Um, you can go see other places in the specific SOP for what we term as variant evidence um, that would be considered strong um, and to include for these different variations as marked. Um, as with strong, you want different types of supporting experimental data if you have it, but it is not required to reach this designation if there is substantial convincing genetic evidence present. And again, that no convincing evidence has emerged that contradicts the role of the gene in the specified disease. So hopefully this is all really clear and you can see that there's a little bit broadening of these definitions so that it doesn't seem as strict or rigid on certain time um, not timeframes, but certain metrics of the number of individuals you have to include. Um, we realize that there, this could be different across um, different diseases and clinical domains. Um, so we're giving a little bit more flexibility for the use. 
at the end of the day, it is at the GSEP's discretion to use their good judgment based on the materials and the evidence that they have. But again, as bio curators, please make sure that you're taking notes. And if there are any nuances to why you may have modified a classification from what was calculated in the GCI, that you give that required um, set of notes and sections that is published to the website. Also put that in your evidence summary. Are there any questions about those definitions before we move on? Okay, so um, I'm gonna move now to the evidence collection and the use of databases. Um, so we do indicate within our gene curation SOP now that use of publicly available databases that have variant or phenotypic data for genes of interest may be considered for use in gene curations. Some examples of those, especially well-known and trusted databases are what we would recommend are gonna be things like ClinVar and Decipher. Um, and when they should be used. Now, definitely talk with your gene curation expert panel to figure out what they consider well-known and trusted databases, especially within your specific clinical domain. There may be ones beyond these broader open access ones that are very specific to a certain um, disease and or clinical domain that they may find useful. But when you consider the use of these, um, consider that the cases must be publicly accessible, right? For our gene curation, um, it is something where all data has to be publicly accessible. Um, when this becomes an issue of it's changing the classification, when you modify it, you can include that you had additional cases for a database. Um, if they don't have a PMID that supports their database um, and how it was being published that you can curate on that, you can add that you used cases and information in your evidence summary and again, modify that classification appropriately. Also consider if a case is well described with appropriate phenotype testing and other variant information. Um, while it's great that we have these databases, if they don't have enough information for you to really evaluate that you could score an individual, it might not be worth including um, in that curation, but you could always remark about the database in your evidence summary. And the case is not otherwise believed to be described in the literature. So this is a really key point is that you want to do your best to make sure that it has not been previously published and that you've already curated and scored that. That could be a duplication of a score which could conflate your classification and change it from potentially a limited to moderate or moderate to strong. Um, so definitely make sure uh, that this has not been published somewhere. And if it has, then use that publication and you can use whatever data they are adding in addition here. It might be that they add there are more variants in this person and a different gene associated with the disease. You may want to score them zero, right? And that would be really important. Um, in other cases, they may add more phenotypes that help allow you to understand or give a functional assay to give you a little bit more indication that um, it was no longer expressed and followed loss of function. So you can detail all of that on that original publication and then enter that it was um, expanded on uh, with a URL link and your points of why you changed a specific score. You also may want to consider that evidence for why the variant classification was made is present, right? Um, are these databases telling you if there is a variant classification, what was the type of evidence they included um, in a case annotated with having a pathogenic variant or nor and no other supporting information may not be sufficient for use, right? Um, so just because someone said pathogenic, you may not know why they have chosen that unless that evidence is present or anywhere with the codes. So um, it is noted that we do have segregation for autosomal recessive disorders and you all who curate um, autosomal recessive disorders on a regular basis will understand this, that oftentimes when you get into certain pedigrees, you may find that um, even though in one generation you have three siblings that are all autosomal recessive for a disorder, when you go look at their parents, which we would typically consider carriers, one of the parents may also be affected. So what I want to highlight here is that our GCI calculation for the estimated LOD score for autosomal recessive inheritance assumes both parents are monoallelic carriers. They only have one variation and they are unaffected. They don't have disease. This is the current formula that it uses on that calculator for that estimated LOD. 
But again, for when there are cases where a parent is also autosomal recessive for the disease in question, this is actually the more appropriate formula um, to take into place. You can see instead of a one in four chance, it's a one in two chance that you would um, get this allele and that shifts that log score. So I just wanna note that the GCI cannot apply any new formulas at this time for this shift. In this instance, if the segregation scoring affects that final classification, then the GSEP should manually modify the classification. So again, if it was limited, but whatever you find and are able to include more individuals because of this score, and it shifts it up enough to go to a moderate, go ahead and manually override that limited classification on your provisional side and going into approval. Um, add your reasoning for why you're modifying the classification and indicate, right, that it was this particular pedigree and that the estimated log would actually be using this formula, give that number. Um, and then that uh, will be published to the website and just be transparent for everyone to see why there was a modification. So this is another big one, proban identifiers and the GCI and how they affect the evidence summary. Um, so I just wanna say the logic on the GCI when it comes to that really nice summary at the end that you can get for a PDF is that it is presenting all the information on you based on your proban label alone. It is not based on any logic or interaction that is a proban for a specific reference. So when you have cases, and we all know this happens, um, papers constantly use the same terminology, proban one, patient one, or if you have pedigrees, you're gonna see two dash one, three dash four. Um, and we do want you to be able to label the program as it was indicated in the paper as best you can. But when you're only using the same program label over and over, it will start to smush evidence all in one program label and make it very confusing um, to the user and to you as you're going to present. And so we just want you to be aware of this. If you see something like this and you're wondering why it's happening on your evidence summary, it's because two people are labeled the same. Now, what can you do? We really want to encourage you all to use unique identifiers for each of your probands and case reports when you're in the GCI, but still respecting what the paper has said. Now, there are different ways that you can go about this. Um, so in the example we showed you before, you could either add the manuscript author's name. In the case, one of them was Wang. So we can say Wang 2-1 or Smith 2-1. That would already make those unique and distinct. You could consider adding the family descriptor for the proban, family 1, 2-1, or KU10, 2-2. Now, this can get tricky, too, because if you have family 1 and family 1 between two different papers, you are now going to have the same situation. So you can also use a combination of author and family descriptors, again, to make it more unique. And at the end of the day, you can get as creative as you can. Think of things of putting in the author and the date because maybe authors have the similar last name. Put in proban and ultimately put the PMID number because that leads it back specifically to a PMID and that is always a unique identifier. I do want to give one slight reminder is that you will have a character limit in the GCI for the program descriptor. And I think that's somewhere around um, 50 characters. I'm getting a little bit more information from our GCI help desk on that. Um, so you still have quite a bit of space, but um, you might not want to go so wild for that descriptor because you may get cut off. We also want to note moving on that we added some additional resources to Appendix A, um, which might be helpful for you all as curators and thinking about pre-curated information or just information you can use during your curations to figure out a little bit more about your disease area or genes. Um, those include gene and gene product sections. We've added a link to Marvel. In the variant databases, we have added links in a little description for ClinVar minor and simple ClinVar. And then we've also added gene curation databases like GenCC, which ClinGen contributes to, but there are many other entities that are doing gene curation that are being published here. It may be really useful for you all in pre-curation even, or your curation phase to go look and see what other entities have curated, just to see if there's additional data that you want to go ahead um, and collect and use. 
Um, they may have different classifications that shouldn't deter you from moving forward with the Clinton framework and talking with your GSEP exactly how you all want to go and classify your gene disease relationship. And lastly, we did add a new appendix, Appendix D, which is talking about how you can acknowledge secondary contributors and approvers. Um, and so this is really important. Many of you may have already done this, but a lot of GSEPs are now collaborating across each other, especially for when you have those genes that are involved in syndromes and may have multiple cardinal features that present in different organ systems um, that happen to span our different clinical domains and GSEPs. And so we want to be able to highlight those collaborative efforts and also to give attributions to each of those GSEPs or working groups that have contributed so that they can get acknowledged for their efforts. And so it is common practice, again, to make sure that when this has happened, you do acknowledge this effort through the use of the secondary contributors function in the GCI. It's also uh, important to acknowledge the shared effort because functionally, um, this allows inclusion of the genes on each GSEPs list of curated genes in the ClinGen website. And these lists are often shared and reviewed in each group's manuscript. So please, this is beyond just courtesy. This really helps to affect how the gene curations are showing up on our website and how this may play out when um, other GSEPs papers are being reviewed. Just as an example, if you go to the ClinGen website right now and type in a gene, if you see this little person, it means that it's secondary contributors or approvers. This is an example of ABCD1, which was curated by the Paroxysomal Disorders GSEP. It means they are the owners of this record, but they have kindly indicated that an expert panel has been a secondary contributor, which is that intellectual disability and autism. If you were to click into that record, you will equally see not only the expert panel that owns the record um, and place this final classification, but you'll see those contributors there as well. And as I mentioned, if you go look at each of these gene uh, GSEPs um, specific list, ABCD1 shows up in both of them. So again, I hope it impressed upon you how important it is to make sure you are putting in secondary contributors and or approvers when it's appropriate. Now you don't have to put the same group in both contributor and approver. Contributor means that they just contributed maybe some sentences to your evidence summary because they agreed with your initial curation um, and they uh, agreed with your initial approver. Now, if they are approving it, it means that they are reviewing your full curation. They've added additional evidence. They've really worked with you at the same time. You may wanna consider putting them as a secondary approver to that, but they don't need to be in both one or the other. However, if you have multiple groups that you have talked with, you can choose multiple groups for this as well. Now you might ask, how do you do this? This is what Appendix D is for. So when you come into the situation, BioCurators, please now go to your SOP version nine and to the Appendix D. When you are at the stage of approval for a gene disease validity curation, uh, you will see there's an acknowledge other contributors uh, button that's there. And Phil will tell you a little bit more. Go ahead and click that button. When you do, it will open up a module. You'll see down from here. You can either click whether someone is a classific classification contributor, excuse me, that's a tongue twister, or if they are an approver. You can ask, um, add different comments here too. These are not going to be published comments. They can be comments that are kept to you and um, that are in the snapshot and history of this record. Uh, once you've picked the one or more um, as appropriate as those contributors, you can also go ahead with the full um, approval and then going to publishing by clicking pre uh, preview approval. I will mention, though, uh, we are trying to um, always add to this list. So you may notice that there are other working groups and there may even be variant curation expert panels. We respect sometimes you have worked with variant, ex uh, variant curation expert panels for a gene curation, you can also acknowledge their contributions here as well. And just to let you know, it is that drop down list. So again, click the list and you can click multiple people. You can um, search by uh, their um, short base name if you know it, um, or you can scroll down the whole list to be able to see. Uh, these numbers correspond also with their IDs on the ClinGen website. So if you happen to go to the website and see the last URL, it may start with a four or five, but look at those last numbers and you can confirm what um, it is uh, and search by that mechanism too. 
Finally, I just want to give you some updates about new GCI functionality that are really important um, with this last release. So the default SOP version for all curations from that beginning of June date on, you will notice will say SOP version nine. If we come back here, you notice it said eight, this will be nine now. Um, if your group is finishing up and deciding to use SOP version eight and want those all to be consistent, this will need to be a manual override. So go in here, um, click the drop down list and go to eight if that's what you need or any other former SOP version. But note, if you go way back into before SOP version eight with the scoring change, it will not bring up the scoring module from SOP seven. It still will always have the new scoring module. So you will have to make adjustments as needed to your scoring. Also, the final approval date is a required field for publishing a classification now. Um, we also want to let you know the approval date will not be automatically applied. Um, it had been previously on the date you had pushed the button, but you need to now actively put in the approval date. This was important because many times backdating was needed um, as the approval may have happened at a certain time, but maybe you all were still looking at the evidence summary and wanting to de detail that. You can backdate. Um, it is allowable, and please use that when it's appropriate. Um, we also want to let you know that the scores have been updated to include 0 0.25 increments. We've gotten a lot of requests for that. So this has, um, you should see this now when you go to score that you'll see 0 0.25, you may see um, 1.25, 0 0.75, et cetera. Um, so you'll have those new increments to use. We also want to let you know each gene curation record is restricted to one GSEP as an owner. Um, so if you all find that there is a prior gene curation uh, that your group wants to curate and it is owned by a different GSEP that may be inactive at this time, you will need to trans, uh, put in a transfer request. You can contact either the gene tracker help email or the GCI help desk. Uh, in order to have that transfer. Um, but we just really want to emphasize that um, these gene disease validity records are, um, have only one GSEP as an owner and only the individuals within that affiliation can and, um, edit that curation. You cannot edit on top of it as a no affiliation anymore. Also initiating a gene curation is restricted to GSEPs only. VSEPs cannot uh, initiate a gene curation record, and you may have noticed before a no affiliation could do that. That is no longer allowed. It is restricted. So make sure that if you want to initiate a gene curation, you have chosen the correct affiliation in your uh, GCI um, dashboard. Again, editing of those gene curations is restricted to the GSEP that owns the record. You can no longer just add evidence on top of it and perform kind of your own curation from a different EP. So again, if it is a point of collaboration between two different expert panels, please have them tell you that evidence that they want entered and enter it underneath your record if your GSEP is the owner of that record. Um, again, if you want to collaborate, you want to connect with those other GSEPs um, that own that record, you can either check within the GCI who's the owner, you can also go into the gene tracker to see the owner of the original record. Um, the gene curation records can only use active Mondo IDs. As you all may know, um, there's definitely Mondo is what we use for our disease entities and IDs. And sometimes those IDs can be obsoleted. Um, now, if you try to put in an obsoleted ID, it will return an error. Um, so if you do see an error on initiating that GDM or gene disease mode of inheritance record, please check whether or not you have put in an obsolete Mondo ID. You can do that by going to the EBI um, OLS uh, section, and you can actually say search by obsolete, and then it will tell you if it is so. If it is anything else, you might want to check that your HGNC symbol um, is accurate and it hasn't changed. Um, and or you have forgotten a mode of inheritance. And if all else fails, contact the GCI help desk if you're having trouble initiating a record. Other things could be because you're under no affiliation, make sure you're under an affiliation. Lastly, I want to let you know that the demo GCI, so this is the test um, phase or the uh, demo, um, however you like to call it, 
has attached a new test site example affiliation to all users, and this allows for easier testing in the demo site. Before, you had to be part of a gene curation affiliation, and so for those that were just starting and really curators needed to start training, they weren't able to log in. So this does improve the access even if you are not a user of an affiliated uh, GSEP at this time. So um, for all of you that want to go test this out, you can just go ahead and register for a login for the demo or test GCI and then get started. Um, just a second reminder though, um, or another reminder, nothing can be transferred. No data can be transferred from the demo GCI to the production GCI. So if you are testing, know that it is just testing there that it would have to be re-entered, but certainly we don't want to discourage you from using it so that you can learn how to use the GCI in that system before you move on to your first um, assigned curation in your GSEP. That is it for the overview, and I am happy to take any questions now.